The ANA eLearning Academy is brought to you by CDN Graysheet, a trusted source of rare coin and currency valuations since 1963. Happy Summer Seminar, and uh, thank you for joining us here at the e ANA's eLearning Academy. I'd like to thank the Gray Sheet for their continued support of our eLearning offerings. We're going to be uh, offering um, an interesting class taught by a longtime Summer Seminar instructor, Brian Silliman, uh, Counterfeit Detection of Key Dates and Mintmark U.S. Coins. This is the second year in a row that we have had to cancel the physical Summer Seminar here in Colorado Springs. We miss you all. We hope to uh, welcome you back next year. But for now, we are making lemonade out of lemons. So without any further ado, I will pass it over to Brian, and he's going to teach you all about counterfeits. Yeah, we're going to look at the key date mint mark coins. Uh, this usually is, this is part of our um, longer four-day seminar so there's quite a bit um, um, of material that we're packing into two whole hours uh, that we would normally spread out across about two and a half days and then we have a day and a half to two days of hands-on um, and these classes are uh, uh, a good starting point but i do recommend for the counterfeits and counterfeits and grading in particular that uh, you do get the hands-on. There's a big difference between looking at these pictures and then having a having the coin in your hand. And there's an even bigger difference when you have that coin in your hand at a show. Uh, it kind of ups the ante, and, and and that's when you start going on. You uh, start forgetting things, uh, or you just can't recall them when you need them. Um, so we're going to look at the the key date mint mark coins. Uh, fair amount of material to cover. So we will jump into it. So counterfeits in general, uh, and when I say counterfeits, I mean counterfeit and altered coinage make up a pretty small part of the market marketplace overall, less than 1%. But it's a, it's a, uh, a very loud 1%. Uh, when you buy one, uh, it uh, is definitely, you're getting spanked and, and hard. Uh, it's not something you're gonna forget. Uh, it's a painful lesson to learn. So we're gonna try to get you to where you can avoid a, a great many of these. Um, now, you're, we've got different types of counterfeits. We have contemporary, uh, which are the older things, which, which usually have uh, hand cut dies, things like that. They're actually collectible and quite interesting. In many cases, they still are counterfeit. Um, cir uh, circulating uh, coinage and collector grade. Uh, we're going to be looking primarily at the collector grade. Uh, these are the most deceptive. They're designed to fool you and fool savvy dealers uh, and even maybe get past a grading surface or two. Uh, alterations uh, is specifically in the, in the realm of color counterfeits. We're looking at uh, date alterations, mint mark alterations, either adding, changing, removing uh, to make it the more valuable specimen. Uh, alterations are usually circulated and or problem coins. Um, typically, if they do the alteration, it'll be a circulated coin. Uh, then they'll try to pass it. If they can't, then they turn the coin into a problem coin by cleaning it or whizzing it or, or any number of things. Um, counterfeits they are always improving uh, but they will probably never be perfect we, we should be able to detect them uh, uh, the better we are at, at studying the coins the better we will be at detecting them. The, 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 the task is to stay current surf the learning curve stay on top of things if you're on facebook um, you know there are a number of groups uh, for dealers collectors and even for counterfeits um, where you can kind of see what's out there, what other people are seeing. Uh, it's pretty useful. I keep track of them, uh, the groups, and, and what people are coming across, what's coming into their store and stuff like that. Uh, 
don't get cocky or overconfident. We frequently get people that will take this class and then they'll want to go out and teach it themselves. And they might make a few mistakes that make them look, uh, that adversely affect their credibility. And I'll say that. So, now don't, don't stress this. I mean, a lot of you are probably thinking this is difficult. Um, how do I get rid of this? Um, that it's it's uh, quite uh, difficult to remember all this stuff, but you'll find that a lot of it is surprising, surprisingly easy to remember. Uh, don't stress or overthink this. Have fun with it. Okay, it's like solving a puzzle. Don't expect to learn it all, but you will be surprised at how much you remember when you walk away from this. Keep learning. Uh, proper coin viewing. You know, do do figure out that and other good habits. Uh, uh, this is a very habitual thing. Uh, you want to always have the best lighting, the good lighting, your loop, uh, a clean workspace, and you know, hold the coin, rotate it around, and, and uh, you'll find that you do better with grading, authentication, with everything. Uh, if you're at a desk one day, the kitchen table the next, and uh, you're bouncing around like that, you're going to be inconsistent in everything you do. Um, be select, selective and patient. Don't settle. There, there is no coin that is that rare that you can't find it someplace else. So if you pick up one, you look at it, and there's something you don't like about it, uh, that would be what I call a butt coin, which we'll get into. Just pass and move on. Um, buy certified till you're comfortable with raw. That, that's very important with, with counterfeits, key dates in, in particular, and, and even to some extent gold. Um, it's better to, to be safe than sorry. Uh, so, uh, but when you do buy certified, make sure they actually have a guarantee. Not all the grading services guarantee that, that the coins are actually genuine. Network, don't collect in a vacuum. If you, you need other people to call you out on your opinions, you need someone, other people to share your thoughts on. Uh, that interplay is how we learn and how we, we get called out on our own nonsense. Um, uh, share your knowledge, but don't, as I said before, don't get cocky. Um, build a reference library. Information is, is priceless. You see an article that you thought was particularly useful, copy it or tear it out, put it in a binder, keep it. Uh, you'll, if you thought it was pretty useful when you read it, you're probably going to need it at some point in the future. Take advantage of other learning opportunities. Those such as our traveling seminars or Maybe the uh, summer seminar next year, we'll hopefully be uh, having hands-on class. We'll be meeting in person and it makes a huge difference. It's a totally different class because there's the interaction. And also it's a tremendous opportunity with net, you would to network with collectors from all over the world. Red flags, uh, even the novice collector will pick up a coin and have a red flag. Something, something's got them jarred. Um, and more often than not, there, there's something that they're right about. They, there is, in fact, an issue with that coin, even though they might not be able to identify it. So listen to your gut. I can't tell you how many times I've been sitting at a table at a show and had someone come up and ask me for an opinion on a coin. And then uh, uh, then they, they preface it with, you know, I had a gut feeling about this coin, but I bought it anyway. And that was mistake number one. Butt coins, we call them butt coins. It's a nice coin, but on this case, nice coin, but that staining that you're seeing right here isn't going anywhere. Everybody's gonna see it when you go to sell it. This is a problem coin. This is a coin that you might own for a long time. Uh, so generally I say, stay away from butt coins. There's, like I said, there's no coin that's that rare you couldn't find a problem for example or an example that didn't have the red flags or the gut feelings that you're having with the coin. Uh, that you're looking at. Buying coins you should not burn in the first place. And that's especially true uh, in the case of uh, counterfeits. A lot of times you can tell the mint mark's not right. Uh, that's a look to it. But you will go ahead and you buy the coin anyway. And don't buy things you don't know about. You know, we always say buy the book before you buy the coin. Now, just to kind of really briefly go over some of the tools of the trade lighting. It's a good idea to have a good lighting. If you can, incandescent halogen and LED aren't bad. The key is to take a white piece of paper, put it under that light, 
and if the paper is not white, maybe it turns blue or green or yellow or has a tint to it, it's probably not the best light for looking at coins, especially copper uh, and anything with toning. Um, experiment with it until you can find day off. It seems like all the state have different rules these days on what lights you can use. Uh, we, we're not supposed to be able to get incandescent here, but I think Amazon will solve that problem. Uh, a triplet loop, that's three lenses, either in one sealed uh, loop or it's three lenses that kind of flip into each other. Um, you know, I don't need to go crazy with it. The, lar the higher power of the loop, the more light you're going to need. And frequently, the smaller the loop is. Some of these 20 power loops are smaller than a dime uh, or, or California fractional gold. Um, the jeweler's pad's going to have the idea to have that just as your background. It's a consistent background and it helps when you drop your $20 wire rim. And uh, it doesn't get everything close at hand. Lighting, okay, we talked, this is an idea. There's a triplet loop where it's sealed in the, uh, in the loop, three lenses. So you'll have a good, uh, less distortion. Here's one where it's three lenses separate. It's not as, as good, but it is still effective uh, and it gets the job done. Uh, and these are very inexpensive. I think they're about 20, 20 to $30. I could be, uh, could be a high on that price. References, this is what I said about building a reference. The thing with key dates and, key, and mint mark coins is that you will forget. Uh, the coin, I, after all these years, still, I'll still just kind of space it, is the 22 no D Lincoln set. I'll frequently uh, be sitting there struggling to recall the diagnostics for that. I, it's not a favorite coin of mine by any means. But um, the... Uh, <coughs> I keep uh, a, a number of key sheets that I'm going to use, um, such as uh, you know some of the reports from the Authentication Bureau, the numismatist counterfeit detection, uh, which was in the numismatist from 2007 to present. There's a number of good articles that pop up on a weekly or biweekly basis in Coin World and Num News. Um, and you can photocopy them you can print them off the web now uh, and just add them to your show kit you know a, a three ring binder with articles on counterfeit detection so do you have the information handy for a show or just keep it at home uh bill had bill fever had a, has a nice little flip uh guide almost like a notepad uh, that goes through a great number of, of uh, counterfeit coins uh, he also did a book on uh, the counterfeit gold detection guide, which goes coin after coin after coin. Uh, if you were in the gold class um, on that last week, uh, or if you take one in the future, for me, you'll see we do it by type, where if you can authenticate one Liberty head gold piece with the flat field and the identicals, you can authenticate the entire series. Slightly different approach. PCGS guide, which is usually available at like Barnes & Noble or Amazon is pretty good as well. Uh, this is a great one here, the Harry Bass Searchable Index of Periodicals. You can enter in 1909 SVDB counterfeit, and it'll give you all the articles in, in its database from a wide range of publications on that coin. And then you can actually, you might be able to find them online. Otherwise, you can have the ANA print the article. They probably have the periodical in the library. Uh, the Mismatist is, uh, is online now, and you can search through prior columns on there. Uh, most of the coins you're going to see have been published. Some of the images are even uh, were taken at AAA, and others I've taken at NGC. Uh, the textbook for the correspondence course that relates to this class is pretty good as well. Also has a DVD. Uh, this one we already talked about. And the AA has reprints from the Mismatist volume one and two. You can still find two fairly easy. It shows up on eBay. I think even Amazon from time to time. Number one is harder to find. But those are all the old original reports from the 60s and 70s. And I think probably even the 80s that the ANA did. It went when they had the Authentication Bureau and then Annex and then back to the Authentication Bureau. So all the, a lot of, or all of the information is out there. It's just a matter of having being able to access it. 
uh, here's a, a thing. Uh, I just put in my last name on the Harry Bass Index, searched it, and, and uh, a review of the 1893 S. Morgan dollar, that was one of the columns going back to 1999. Um, a rogues gallery of fakes, uh, the 1892 S. It, it's all, it'll have all the columns I uh, wrote, two counterfeit $5 golds for the common offers. Uh, that coin was actually in the class we taught on gold last uh, week. So that's how easy the Harry Bass Foundation is. And some of the online, uh, the auction archives are great, especially from key date and key uh, mint mark coins. So if you have a coin you think is an alteration, pull up that coin on Heritage uh, on their in their auction archives or, or, or stacks and uh, compare the date or the mint mark style uh, and you'll frequently find that there's an issue uh, because there's is going to be authenticated and genuine and the piece you have may have a completely different style date or mint mark. Uh, the a a Coin World News News, the a Library is online. Uh, grading services, uh, I know NGC does uh, keep a, a pretty good uh, little catalog of articles on counterfeits that are quite useful. Um, some, of, some of that stuff I produced and, and, and then it's produced since I left. Coin dealer websites. Uh, you can go to my coin, uh, my website, for example. Um, and uh, there are, there's a wide range of articles that I've produced uh, back when I was with ANA that are on the website and they're available for free in PDF form. Specialty clubs are always nice. Uh, coin forums, Facebook groups, Dark Side Counterfeits and Fakes, uh, which is on Facebook, is a great, a great little uh, little Facebook page that's got material popping up, uh, I don't know, probably 10, 15 posts a day of, of stuff. And you can always Google it, but with anything on Google, you're going to get the good and the bad. You go build a show kit. It's a three ring binder with your want list, inventory notes, authentication articles, variety information if you're going after anything particular, your value guide, such as the coin dealer newsletter, business card and contacts. It's always good to, if you got a good deal off a dealer, to keep going to that dealer. Likewise, if you got a guy who's not, you might want to avoid him in the future. Nothing wrong with keeping a note on that. Basically, it's a compact, adjustable, portable office because most people go to shows. And having access to that information will save you a lot of money if you make a mistake. So basic on a counterfeit, it's an unmarked copy. Okay, we're looking at alterations. Um, they are illegal to knowingly buy, sell, or own, despite what people tell you. Uh, they, there are new, new novelties, souvenirs, uh, and then there's also the coins that are designed to fool us. We're only really looking at coins that were designed to fool us. And in a couple of cases, it's filler for an album. Um, we're going more specifically to the altered coin. It's a genuine coin, but it's an added or removed mint mark uh, or an added, uh, or excuse me, an altered date. Usually the last digit in the date is changed. Well, so it's it's technically not a counterfeit, but it is still fraud and it is designed to defraud. And there is an implied warranty when you buy some, if you somebody's put up a, a 1916D on Facebook Marketplace or, or eBay or you know, Heritage or anything, there's an implied warranty that it is actually a 1916D unless they have actually explicitly said otherwise. So legality is questionable. Secret Service is taking a lot bigger interest in a lot of material these days, um, but it is fraud. Uh, so there is there is always that. So let's jump right in. We're gonna look at some of the more common material um, yeah, because of our time limit. Flying the the 1856 Flying Eagle cent. Who you know, usually when we have this class live uh with where everybody's there i can usually see a couple of people roll their eyes which means they either bought it or they the coin intimidates them this one's easy it's really really easy and it all boils down to these two images here the date has a characteristic style okay the mint made it that way that's how they're all going to look and this is that style 
your back bone goes right through the center of the ball in the five, which has, a, for some reason, a deficit. If it has that, it's genuine. You can see that all the way down to the circuit, that with the well circulated examples. You can usually see this as well. So that would mean this coin is an alteration. The style is, you know, just nuts. So what they did was they altered the last digit and the date, because this is the date style for the other dates. Okay. So alteration, genuine. So all you have to do is remember cuts through the ball in the five and there's a deficit. And if you want to remember this as well, you can now authenticate pretty much every single 1856 Flying Eagle scent that comes your way. The only time you might want to into a problem is somebody has whizzed the coin where they wire brush it and just obliterate all of the original surface. Sometimes the metal moves enough that it makes it a little bit tougher, but you're good. And usually all the way down to a good graded coin, maybe even less, so they don't always circulate evenly. So the 1856 should not intimidate you at all now. So if we look at this, here is our genuine state style. We can look at both of these digits, but I only ever really pay attention to this. Pick it up, look at it, boom. If you needed more, more uh, diagnostics, the, the O and of is the center is more rectangular, uh, rounded, but rectangular. Uh, in the 1857, it's oval, and then the 1858, it's an oval D-shaped center. Okay, so going to this coin, we have it, full obverse, we look at it, and we should be pausing on the date. Does not look right, so we go in for the close-up. Um, it misses it and it doesn't have the deficit. We know it's bad. It's an altered. <clears throat> this. Okay, so let's say you 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 started collecting Indian scents and you just have no clue. You see this one, you like it. It looks uncirculated. It's it's you know it looks like a good coin. Uh, it's a good idea even maybe pick up the red book or you know the, a book on Indian sense and kind of get you familiar as yourself what are the better dates what should I be worried about you know uh, these days with the Chinese fakes you got to worry about a lot more but if you picked up that book and you looked at the picture or you went to the heritage's website you're going to notice that the date styles are completely different from the genuine coin this is in fact a Chinese fake and they just add the dates in to complete the whole series once they have a good scan of the obverse and reverse. So, but we pick it up, we look at the date, all the digits are added to a fake. Uh, but if we com done a comparison on Heritage's website or, or eBay, we would see that that's not even close to real. 1877, here's another one that kind of spooks people. Uh, common date alteration, the last digit of the date is, is most frequently altered. Not a terribly difficult coin to authenticate. Um, the, 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 your typical diagnostics are that the top and base are thicker. This, this is a, a thicker than this, and this does appear to be thicker and, and even is a bit lower than the prior seven. And the idea being the, the 187 is one punch and then the seven is the second punch. So they can, you know, so they can do the eight next, the nine next. So, uh, so thicker and hangs, is thicker and hangs down more. And also the ends on the reverse. It's kind of fun. Uh, the ends drift into or sink into the field. Uh, on the year genuine 1877. If, if they don't, they're typically a proof. Uh, uh, but just because we can't leave well enough unknown in a counterfeit class, uh, you'll notice the granularity on this and the, and the smooth fields, that's indicative of an EDM or an elect a spark erosion counterfeit. So the counterfeit did pick up the weakness in the ends, but on your genuine piece, you have the distinct seven, which we'll see, and then the ends in the nine. 
thicker and thicker and goes down a little bit further. And then here's our sinking, not our sinking ends in the, in the uh, one set. So if we go to the next one, thicker, goes down further. You have a nice fine die crack. That's always nice. And it kind of jogs back and forth. If it was a straight crack, that could be a crack from pressure in the striking, um, which usually you expect to see on a, on a fake. We go to this one, thicker, and hang down now. Oh, so it must be real. But if we look at the rest of the coin, tremendous weakness, but they've recut the diamonds. This is actually a struck fake. Uh, so they did have a, a genuine host coin. So that's why they've got the date style correct. 8 and 9 S Indians. Um, these aren't, aren't, aren't too bad. Uh, you, you can usually get if you just get a good feel for the mint mark. If you can commit that to memory uh, or keep it in your little show kit binder, uh, you can usually authenticate these without too much trouble. There are fakes. The fakes, I think, you're more likely to come across, but that's just my exposure to the market. Some uh, some dealers uh, may say, oh, I, they, they see the mint mark editions all the time. But uh, here we're looking at a coin. It's got that nice wood grain look to it. We're looking at the mint mark. And let's see, did I give you the mint mark? Yeah, the mint mark style. Uh, it's got the... It's almost closed top, a much wider opening. It's got nice defined serifs. Um, and then something else we like, it's got that little die chip there. Okay, so if we go on, it doesn't look, uh, it looks like both the top and the bottom are relatively well closed. I'm not really seeing any die chip there. I do even have some discoloration, which could be, be the oxidation from the epoxy, or if it was soldered on, it could be heat uh, impairment from the soldering process. We'll look at this one, which is, I don't remember this slide being this dark. Um, okay, the, the 1908S is, is pretty rare uh, with full feathers. Uh, so you might wanna look at the design piece, the piece and see how it is. 1909S uh, being the lowest mintage in the series, uh, except for the uh, 1877. Um, the top set of the mint mark does almost touch and the bottom is usually wider. Uh, and the alterations, it's usually wide on both and that kind of looks wide on both of them. The top and the bottom loops almost uh, don't almost touch. So let's take a, another look here we have it looks like it's almost touching. It's well-defined, a bit of separation there. And that almost looks like the die chip. This, that's that's just too much. And the coin is harshly impaired, uh, altered surfaces as well. Uh, so even if, even without looking at the mint mark, I would have passed on the coin just looking at its overall appearance. But uh, going in to look at the mint mark, I'm passing on it for sure right there. I want the mint mark looks pretty good, right? Small gap, large space, but we have spikes and tool marks and a, and a sharp edge from striking with more pressure. This again, they've taken a genuine coin and they've made a copy of it. But they did get the mint mark style right. Now your, your, a lot of your counterfeits, like your Chinese, the, the mint mark is usually the incorrect style, the dates, even the incorrect style, but on a lot of the struck counterfeits that are designed uh, probably here in the, in the States uh, in years past, they're going to use a genuine host coin typically. So you're, you're not going to have that added authentication feature to, to fall back on. And then the most common of all the rare coins, uh, they like to say. Um, Pretty simple, actually, most of the time. Uh, one to sink, mid mark style. And it was used on a lot of coins from the same period. Uh, four distinct mid mark positions, it zigs and down. 
uh, there are strut counterfeits, but they're they're not as as uh, they're not very good, um, and they're not as common. Uh, it's like there's a whole gang of people that just sit at home adding mint marks to 1909 uh, BDBs. One mint mark style couldn't get any easier. We're not talking straight, upright serifs, a deficit in the upper serif, and the chip in the upper loop. They all have that. Okay, some fakes will have the correct shape, but they miss the finer details. Okay, so it's a boldly struck, very strong S mint mark. Uh, unfortunately, if the if the coin's going to get damaged, it's almost always on top of the mint mark, which makes it a little harder. But you should be able to detect it. If it's filled with dirt, it means the person who's selling it doesn't know if it's real either. So we look at this and we're looking for parallel upright serifs or, or maybe just even having serifs. And it's more of a snake S, so we can just pass on it. You're not getting paid to authenticate the coin. You're deciding whether to put money down on it. So that, uh, that's a good indication of just walk and find another one. And 1909 S is so commonly rare that you can find it almost anywhere. Okay, now well, we look at this one. We've got good metal flow. We've got distinct upright serifs and a chip. That one is genuine. This upright serifs. Well, we got one, but the other one looks like someone on their knee and the, their shoe is at an angle. So no, we pass. Look at this one. Up oh, and same look. Pass. Look at this one. Okay, now we can take a closer look for grade, price, and all the other goodies that we like. That one's definitely genuine. The nice thing of the four mint mark positions. One mint mark style, four positions. One upright chip. Can't really make out the deficit. You can see a little bit of the deficit, the chip, upright serifs. Deficit. Serifs, chip, serifs, not a little hard to see the deficit, but the chips there, but we have good metal throw going through all of them and that wood grain look to it. So if that wasn't enough, one of these guys who has just way too much time on his hands decided to add the VDP. Now here again, the VDP has a very uh, distinct style, the V period, the D, which sometimes missing with dive, but the D comes back down, this kind of swoops back down. And you can see the same swoop back on the B as well. This one, V, they didn't even bother with periods. It's a very rounded typewriter-ish. And this one mostly looks like an eight a little bit, but it's a B. So they, they don't get that right. So make sure you flip the coin, take a look. And again, V, the D, the V just just, you know, round faced. This even looks a bit of an eight. We don't have any of that swoop that we had on the others. None of it. So the 1909 is VB. Here we are. We spent about a minute on it, maybe two. You should be authenticated, but you'll authenticate the vast majority of it. But just to make sure, we'll throw in a trap coin. We always have to throw in a trap coin. 1909 SVDB. There's our VDB. It actually looks pretty good from here. The mint mark looks pretty good from here too. But because this is my presentation, we know that it's probably not okay. We go up for a closer look. There's our upright serifs. It does look like one of the positions. We have a period. We could compare it to the positions. But I'm seeing something here. Something here, a little bit of something there. We'll have to rotate the coin around and take a better look. I am seeing more things. Well, we'll take a look at the rest of the coin. Oh. R, T, Y, Liberty. So this coin was overstruck on another coin. So we had fake 1909 SVDB dies, probably 
impact dies. And they were then the copper hardened, and then they laid it over the top of another Lincoln cent, which in this case was a something from the 1960s, and they overstruck it. So they got the right style, even though it was a weak S. They got the right style, and they just used the fake as a host coin. Seen this a few times. Now then we go to this one. Nice wood grain texture. Looks like we have a good PDB and a good S. We go in for a closer look and we have what appears to be a mess. Most people will say, oh, it's got extra metal. That's probably from where they soldered it on. No, no. This is actually the S over S horizontal. This is a variety, it's a popular variety. And it sh shows up on the S 1909S scent. So if we flip over, we see that they have added the VDB. That's 1909S uh, over S. Horizontal does not have the VDB on it. It's only $10, $20 more than the uh, regular S variety. Okay. You pick up this coin, you're at the show. It's in a junk box, you think you've got something special, and you had a red flag. One, you didn't like the copper, uh, the corrosion spots, and two, the date doesn't look quite right. And then that would be because it's altered. There is no 1910D. It's a good idea to pick up the red book and look up the coins you're, you're potentially purchasing. There is no 1910D. I believe this coin is in the ANA set. We would have a chance to examine it in person. Nineteen fourteen d Again, this isn't a, a tough coin either. It's uh, relatively easy. If they're going to do a date alteration, it's going to be should be fairly obvious. The D mint mark has very characteristic style, kind of a triangular-ish opening, strong upright serifs, and looks almost like it's sitting in a depression. Uh, these are almost always clean to hide the alteration. So and they've either altered the date or they have added the D. So let's take a look at a few. 14D, we have our digits look correct. We don't have an overly large separation. So it wasn't a 44. The four looks original, not an alteration. The D does look like it's sitting in a, in a lake, on a hill in a lake, which is a result of how it's punched into the coin or into the die, excuse me. So you want to check for tooling or if the coin or if the mint mark looks like it's sitting right on the top of the coin that's a, a, a red flag as well so let's look at a couple more these are actually the six positions and notice they all have that look of sitting in a depression but a slight hill in the center of that now all of our dates look about the same those are your six positions and i've never bothered committing them to memory i've I used to have the, the S uh, from the SVDB committed to memory as far as its positions, but I'm not seeing as many of them these days. Here's our genuine mint mark. I think this was the first picture we showed. It does have that kind of like it's in a recess on a hill in the center of a recessed area. And then if we go to this one, it's got a cat's eye opening and it's clearly just flat on the coin. This one actually is, that's the original feel of the coin and they've just removed the metal from around it um, using a, 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 like an etching chem, uh, chemical. Take a look at this one. You know, the mint marks look style looks about right. Uh, it, it's not, it may appear like it's sitting in that, but that's actually the epoxy or the solder um, oxidizing. Uh, the epoxy is frequently termed blue, gray, or green. And the oxidation uh, can go dark frequently or, or light, or it just never tones up in that area. 
a few things going on, but this would have been a red flag. This is, it should have been a big uh, red flag to go in and look closer at it. I would imagine you can see a rough edge, maybe even the, a seam or, or the epoxy or the, or the solder on the coin. Uh, if you went in with, let's say, seven to 10 power. Right, throw this up, take a look. Okay, I get a red flag. It's got more of an alphabet soup style D as opposed to strong with serifs, you know, bold D. And that would be the appropriate D mint mark style for 1944. Yeah, the style of lettering did change over the years. So that one is an altered date. My least favorite coin ever. Uh, the 22 no D. Um, this is, might be one of the finest ones I own. Uh, you should always carefully examine it. Uh, not only are, are your, your mint mark uh, alterations somewhat common, um, but if you misattribute it, that's going to be an expensive mistake as well. Because uh, there are uh, multiple die pairs, and, and nowadays it's not just no D in 1922, no D, there's a weak D, and, and there's I think, several uh, varieties of, of, of it, its progression from normal to the variety, the uh, 22 no D. So there are those. I, I'm only going to talk to you about the, uh, the no D. Uh, the true no D as, as, as it had always been uh, discussed, uh, the weed ears are blended together and there's a, a die crack coming out of the uh, eye and pluribus. Um, the uh, die pair two is the one we like, which is uh, it's a slight rotation, but it's strong, uh, strong weed ears on the reverse. Um, die pair three, it's, slightly rotated to the 11 o'clock position, uh, and it, it doesn't have the strong reverse. We usually grade these by the reverse as well, or the reverse is weighted more uh, in the grade. So we pick up the coin, we look at it, it it's definite, it kind of looks like a 22, no D, but let's go in. Uh, it should have the strong reverse. Uh, no trace of a D mark, mark. Okay, and the L in Liberty, mushy. Uh, and against the rim. The R in Liberty is weaker than the other letters. It is pretty weak. Yeah. Um, in God we trust is weak. Uh, but the tr trust is stronger, especially the T in the trust. And the second two in the date has more definition. It's stronger. See how these are kind of bleeding and very soft. And this one has a bit more strength to it. So those are the things we are looking for. So let's look a little closer. We in got we, and then the trust is quite a bit stronger, actually. The, the bleeding dates, and then we have the much stronger two. No trace of a DMV mark, as we can see. L is up against the rim and very weak. The R is kind of fat and mushy. I'd kind of say the T and Y are stronger, but that's kind of typical for that. So we look at the date. Our digits as we like them, plus the two, which is very strong. And then we have this, where everything is strong. And you can almost see where this looks a little bit wavy, where the mint mark's probably been removed and the coins subsequently been whizzed. Okay. Your 55 double D. There, these, this, this, these are actually popular with Chinese counterfeits, too. I've seen a dozen different versions of it, but they're all horrible and none of them have the diagnostic we like. Um, but these all look like they happened at the same time. This is a key that we will see in the others, uh, over dates and, 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 and whatnot, where, where one looks like it's part of the coin and the other one almost looks like it happened after the fact. These, all these digits, they look like they're all part of the coin. They have a look to them where they meet the fields and everything like they all happened at the same time. Okay. Now the doubling should be crisp. They're all basically the same height as well. So we'll go into this. But we go to the back. Uh, and actually, I will start. Now there's usually like a little raised 
lip uh, on the rim, a little bit back from the edge on these. But I would go usually just go straight to the back and I go straight for these two fine raised lines that eventually do cross down here. Um, they're there. Um, as the specimen is more and more circulated, the lines get shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. But even on the lowest grade specimens, I'll see usually two, see two little nubs coming out there. Uh, they are the beginning of those lines. They're there, they're always there. If you don't see it, why risk it? Just go the other direction. Yeah, there's the two, and you can see it's fairly strong right there. And then it goes down. These two lines of dye polish. If it's genuine, it has it. Okay. Well, like we said before, um, you know, can, there are contemporary counterfeits, and and it's a, you know a little photo comparison doesn't hurt. Uh, there's there's quite a few coins that I've done photo comparisons on, uh, just to play it safe. Uh, when I was working for Panda America, I, I would I would go against known genuine coins. And I would, I would compare some of the pandas or different uh, rarities uh, with known genuine pieces, looking for differences in style or just in the overall fabric of the coin. For mint mark alterations and for date alterations, it's a good idea to have a good feel for what the coin looks like so you can spot. I mean, and eventually you'll, you'll, it'll, when you know what the coin should look like, you'll get those red flags when there's anything out of the ordinary. Um, this would have passed a lot of people with this. If you had that comparison piece, um, you would know that this is actually a hand cut die from back in the day. And uh, the digits and, and all these other things have, have flaws that won't match a genuine mint product. That's one another reason. If, you don't, if you're not familiar with the coin, get familiar with it before you buy it. 1912, it's a popular one. Uh, a lot of times you pick up this coin, you see this, you know, and it kind of gives a, a, a possibility that it had been dipped in the past and it's got the, the uh, oxidations coming back. Uh, nickels are particularly tough and you frequently a good idea not to dip. But this one, we're going to look at the overall surface of the coin. You know, even with this, this look, I, I might still be considering it. But then when I look at the mint mark, um, that's giving me some cause to look closer. So at this point, I would pick up my loop and go in closer to the coin and take a look and it looks like I've got some extra metal. I've got an uneven mint mark. Uh, looks like I might have some seams. The, the coin's been cleaned uh, and it's recoloring. Uh, and if I go around more, I'm gonna see more seams and the mint mark's not correct uh, in, in its style uh, that I have an added mint mark or I just have enough information, information to just pass on the coin. You know, I, I, I probably won't say anything to the dealer. I'm just not gonna buy it. You know, try to that, you can actually see the seam there where they just popped it right on top of the coin. Metal should flow down the side of the mint mark into the coin. And nickel's hard, so it does end up wear quicker. 13. See quite a few of these uh, date alterations usually. Um, some are just outright fakes, but the date alterations are popular because, you know, uh, you can put it in your collection and you got the complete set as opposed to actually going out and buying uh, a, a genuine specimen for a few million. Um, so either you're looking at this, you're like, oh yeah, this will be a nice fake to add to my set. Um, this is just a bad picture of the BB specimen in the a &A's library. This is, I mean, in the a &A's museum, this is actually genuine. It just looks horrible. So. You just call the genuine 1913 bad based on a photo. Um, this one, surprisingly easy. And I, I can remember coming up in the hobby and, and a, a couple of dealers would just bitch and moan about how hard this one was and how they, you know, they weren't sure they'd have to get somebody else to look at it. This one's actually super, super easy. Um, one, you just kind of get a feel for how the, the 18, 1918 sits on top of that that seven uh, they you know, it's uh they both had it all happened at one time they didn't stamp 
the the 18 at the 17 and then stamp the 18 on the coin or anything like that it all happened on the coin at the same time so it's i don't know i have all the areas around the date are going to be the same so but if we go here we don't necessarily need to worry about that that's why you can get these in a junk box where they think it's an 18 and uh, they throw it into you know just a low value and it's got that crack here that crack it's there it shows up on even low grade specimens like this yeah, but here's an here's an example of what i'm talking about the, the metal flow into the coin into the coin metal flow into the coin metal flow into the coin metal flow into the coin all of this happened at the same time so it all is going to wear and have metal flow and whatnot at the same way this one we're looking at and it's just some strike uh 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 just some extra edging and whatnot that's not to worry about but see we do have that metal flow but then this comes in at, 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 a, at a 90 degree angle so everything looks like it's part of the coin except for this which has been pushed in i mean added after the fact but if we go back we come in here beautiful high grade specimen and it's in the crack is quite long low grade specimen you might just get that little bit of a nub right. but you can authenticate even lower grade specimens so if it has that it is this it's the 18 over 70. the embossed mint mark Mint mark looks like it's part of the coin. I look at it closely, I can't find seams. There may be some issues on the style or how it's sitting, you know, it's the, how it's kind of like struck up. Um, <clears throat> but maybe I just had a slight red flag. But either way, these days, anytime I have a mint mark that's close to the edge of the coin, I look at the edge of the coin because when you cut away. Uh, you get permission from the owner to cut away the coin, you might find a hole in it. Basically, what they do is they drill a tiny hole in the coin, and then maybe they have a, like a needle nose pliers type device with a mint mark on the end of it. Uh, and they put it into the coin and then squeeze it to bring the mint mark up from the inside of the coin. So it won't have edge seams and it will be closer to the correct style. Uh, they're going to make sure of that, but it might not sit in its relationship between it and the field of the coin the way the genuine would. The easy way to look at these is to, if the mint mark's close to the edge of the coin, just give the edge a little bit of a look. You should be doing it anyway, in case the coin's ever been mounted or, or had a bezel drilled into the side. But the uh, the metal flows around the edge of the coin. I mean, the you have the smooth edge of the coin, but then you'll have an area where the metal might even be a different color, where they've soldered or filled, and they've um, filed it. And these, there's I've seen a few of these actually, uh, despite the amount of work I've seen quite a few, and and the nickel isn't the only one that gets it. Uh, it, the coin has to be thick enough to do it to it, but the, the nickel, and then I've seen it on a Morgan dollar as well. Just one quick thing to note. Occasionally you'll find people that will re get the horn to make it look better. It is an alteration. It's just a, a small alteration I'm a, a alteration as compared to a mint mark or a date alteration, but something worth showing up. I've seen a lot of these lately. Uh, stay away. I just be, be, be aware of it. But always look at your date and mint mark. And now on the buffalo, the edge. Now here's the, the granddaddy of a wall, and it's probably one of the easiest coins to authenticate. A very simple slogan. But we'll go through the diagnostics anyway. Um, I believe it was a die clash, and then they polished it out. And in the process, you lose the ankle, not the whole leg or the hoof, just the ankle of that front leg. Then in the process, they created this arc of raised metal. And we also see that 
the P and the U have separated from the buffalo. They used to touch the buffalo's back. Right, so we'll go in for a closer look. Just the, just the ankles missing. Hoof is still visible. Then we they also have this moth eating kind of worn down look on both the back leg and the back of the neck. But I always go with my slogan. If the buffalo is pissing, the leg must be missing. And that's exactly what we have here. It looks like the buffalo is urinating and the leg is missing and that you will find on the genuine piece. So we look at this. We do not have that, but the coin surface have been worked over pretty well. So just to be sure, we also do not have that eaten away, moth-eaten rough back of the neck or back of the leg. That's enough to say the coin is genuine. I mean, uh, this one is not genuine, excuse me. Again, you know, if you're not familiar with the coin, make sure you look at a picture of it. Um, the date is awful. Uh, this is a Chinese fake. They got a good uh, design of the, the obverse and they just went in 1841, 42, you know, just went through adding all the dates that they needed uh, in the computer and cutting dies for them. So they can do the whole series off one scan and just a few, uh, a few graphic design changes. So compare, compare, you know, it's like you, you might buy that 10D if you don't buy it looking, if you don't bother looking up, you might make a big mistake and buy 41. Oh, that's as fake as can be. 16D, relatively easy. Uh, this one can be a bit trickier than the others ones we've seen before, just by the way the D is and the way it's such a small coin, the way it frequently gets damaged and the way it wears kind of flat and you lose some of the definition to it. But it's a common with mark alteration. There are some fakes. Um, the, the most of those are going to be your Chinese fakes, and they range in style from complete garbage to eh, not too bad. Uh, four mint mark positions, distinct mint mark style, and it's the same mint mark style we saw on the 14D. I said this one has some strike issues. Uh, two of the mint marks are repunched uh, with it and have a notch. Uh, that you kind of make out of here. And you'll see on the others, I've got, I think, three of the four mint marks uh, pictured uh, that are genuine. Uh, but the mint mark has a distinct style, the straight and serifs, and it lines up. Uh, both the back of the E and the back of the E are parallel. And then the serifs, they're on the same horizon, let's say. Uh, they just move as the mint mark position moves, uh, these move and are in a different relationship, but they're still, you know, parallel to the, uh, the ser or the, the uh, vertical or the horizontals on the E. So, and it's parallel to the back of these, so they always sit at an angle. Frequently alterations are sitting straight up and down. They don't have the serifs. Um, these are the three of the four. So we have a notch effect bold mint mark, triangular-ish opening, and it's in relation to the E. Then this one, it's in a good relation to the E. It's got a bigger notch effect, triangular open. It's bold as we want, bold, no, no notch effect, but we do have the, it's, it's in, a, in, a, in alignment, let's say, with the E in all three cases. This one, it may be slightly out of alignment. It has points, cat ears, as opposed to serifs, more of an oval opening. We can safely say this is not, in fact, uh, genuine. This is a, an added D. Go to this one. Bold. Struck onto the end of the coin. Triangular opening. Very nice. Genuine piece. This one, absolutely horrible. Now, oval, fat, 
square mint mark, but they did at least get it in the right position. So we can go to this one. Now this one's your trap coin. I'll tell you right off the bat. Okay. Some people will pick this coin of this. This came from a major auction house. Uh, it, it was pulled from the sale. Uh, we we look at the the coin and the, the color is 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 very nice, but it is a distraction. We have a little bit of fingerprinting in it. Um, the, you know, see the 16 and it's yeah, very, it's a nice coin. And we may be distracted enough to not take a look at the mint mark, which if you look at the mint mark, it's kind of has a pointy front and the serifs, it's not in the right position. And it's got more of a rounded uh, D shaped interior. And it would be a very nice, uh, 16 Philadelphia with spectacular toning or very nice toning with an added D med mark. And basically they just did it. It ended up in somebody's collection long enough to tone. And now we have it looking like this. So that was an added D med mark, the 21. Now, as we, had, what coin did we see before where the digit style changed over the years? This is an example of that. Here is our original 21 with a very stylized one, the two, the nine, the eight, both ones. They all have a very nice, you know, that early art deco-ish style. And we go into the 1940s and we have less style to it. We have a closed nine. Uh, we have ones with the, the little pointy serifs. They don't kind of arch off like a flame. And so this is a date alteration, 1941, let's say, to uh, or down into a uh, 21. And they do it for both the P and the D dimes. Yeah, 26, normally you wouldn't take a look at it, but it's a semi key and we should take a look at it. And this actually came in at the, when I was at NGC uh, and there was a run of them. I think it was like 10. And they, uh, they had a couple, they, they, the, the, the group of 10 was salted with two, I believe, uh, with added mint marks. Now we look at the obverse and reverse, and, uh, the mint marks just get my attention a little bit, the way it's reflecting the light. So I'll go in for a closer look. And sure enough, I've got seams all around it and it seems in between and they probably soldered it to the edge of the coin. I mean, to the field of the coin. <laughs> and it didn't match. It looked different to the others, the, the genuine 20 successes that were in that box. So that's why it stood out a little bit. And as I was talking earlier about how when you have an overdate like this, it, it all is struck at the same time. So the metal's flowing up and down it and over it all in the same way. Whereas if you have an alteration, you have this, which was part of the coin and the metals flowing up and over it. And then you have the alteration, which happened in the fact, which doesn't fit with the surrounding surfaces of the coin. Now they'll whiz this or, or clean it to kind of conceal that a little bit. So then you look at the style and one, they forgot to do the rest of the four. Um, they took the one too far up. They've got extra metal in here because these aren't filled. And they've made a number of messes in the pro, pro in the process. Look at this one here, and it's just absolutely horrible. Keep in mind, people out there bought these coins, and then they were subsequently sent in for grading, or they went to uh, they were donated to the ANA for their counterfeit detection set. This is one that's in the set. The 32D and S for that matter, quarters. This is a fun one. Another easy to remember slogan. If the mint mark looks bad, the coin is probably good. And if the mint mark, yeah, okay. And that applies to both the D and the S. So if the mint mark looks bad, it's probably good. And uh, an early, early episode of, of the Pound Stars, they had a guy come in to look at one of these, a 32D. 
and it, it was very brief, very fast the way it went through, but they showed the mint mark and, and the mint mark looked bad. I mean, it looked uh, the way I'm going to show it to you here. And he, he looked at it and said, it looked good. So I think the guy may have actually got it wrong, uh, not knowing the rule and not being familiar with it. Uh, it wasn't anybody that I think anybody knows, but uh, it was a bit of a shock. I, I only wish I was DVRing it at the time. So, but yeah, the mint mark, if it looks bad, if it looks good, it's bad, okay? So let's go in and we'll see what I mean when I talk about that. That looks bad, doesn't it? It looks horrible, doesn't it? You know, all sorts of this over here and this and it's filled and it's rough and it kind of looks like it rises up in a pyramid. And my vast majority, my vast majority of people are gonna say, that's, that's added, that's, that's ridiculous. Nope. That is a genuine mint mark. It's sitting in a little bit of a depression. It's got metal flow going and die polish going right up to it, through it and behind it and out of after it. Uh, it's got the, the heavy handed strike, they like to call it. Um, you know, it does have a somewhat mushy look uh, due to strike doubling. You can see that over here. Uh, the, open, the, the opening of these, it's always shallow. Uh, sometimes it's it's even shallower than this. Uh, the S is kind of the same, the same hot mess. It looks kind of the same way. Um, on the genuine, you know, it's, but it is a bold, very strong mint mark. Uh, there's a couple lines of dye polish that go right through it. Um, uh, there's, let's see, would you have the S mint mark here? Uh, if the mint mark looks bad, it's good. That's relatively easy to see. We'll go and look at some. You still need to, you still can check for seams. It's going to be too tough on that mint mark, but let's look at this. Okay, so here it is. It's very little opening. It's it's a it's a bold mint mark. It's even got the strike doubling. Uh, it looks it does not look like it happened when the rest of the coin happened. It looks like it was added after. The mint mark looks bad, so it's good. If we go to this D. It looks like it was set on the coin. It looks like it was, it looks like it belongs on that coin, but it's not. It's got seams. It doesn't blend into the field or anything, but yeah, it looks good. So it's bad. It looks bad. So it's good. We'll look at an estimate mark. All right, here we go. It looks bad. It looks like it's been added to the coin, uh, but it's boldly struck and it is sitting in a little bit of a depression. Uh, which the other one was, the Genuine D does as well, which is partially the result of striking. So you should be able to authenticate the vast majority of them. Hey, look at this one. That mint mark looks like it's sitting on top of the coin. But it's in a holder. It must be real. Yeah, well, not this holder. This is a uh, Chinese-made counterfeit, and then it was put in an aftermarket Chinese-made PCGS, fake PCGS holder. And, uh, you know, if you pick it up and you look at the mint mark right away, you know it's bad because the mint mark looks like it's part of the coin. looks good. And, you know, it's a good looking mint mark, so it's bad. So, now that's thoroughly confused you. I mentioned whizzing earlier. That's where they take a wire brush, not, not unlike something, uh, you know, a similar type of movement that you might expect from uh, those polishing things that the dentist or the hygienist used to clean your, polish your teeth. A similar type idea and it moves the metal around you usually but instead of the metal going to and from the center of the coin it may kind of swirl to it or, or at least be curved to the center of the coin uh, the metal is pushed up against the digits and you usually have these weird uh, discoloration or, or just a different color luster around anything raised and the metal pushes up on the sides but they would do this They'll do this in some cases. One to make will make the coin look better. In the case of copper, frequently it's to remove corrosion. Uh, and in the case of alterations or key dates, usually to hide the fact that they've altered the coin. Now we'll go to this. This is a fun one. Anybody recognize these icons? Yeah, these came off of the bay, good old eBay. And this was a, a fun thing. Um, that, that came up and, and, and somebody was uh, paying enough attention to catch it. So let's uh, take a look at these. 
There we go. So the coin went up on eBay. That's these marks. And it was sold. A dime also was sold. Um, yeah, it was a dime. Um, and two weeks later, it shows up on eBay again. And that's nothing wrong with that. Um, but clearly the same coin. What was wrong with it, though, is it went up on eBay. And then two weeks later, it went back up on eBay. Different, uh, different seller. So on eBay, bought and it sold and then finds its way back up onto eBay. But uh, I guess the, the mint mark didn't make the trip. So uh, eBay immediately jumped. Someone caught it and eBay jumped on it and they did go after the person that was selling it. So it's always a good idea to pay close attention to your coins. Uh, silver dollars. Uh, there's no shortage of alterations, uh, mint mark alterations at least. Uh, and certainly no shortage of struck counterfeits, ranging from absolutely horrible casts to nicely well-struck, but in a base metal, fakes. Uh, mint mark alteration, you're dealing with a big coin. Uh, and it's a flat field coin. Okay, if you're doing anything to this, it's, it's going to be pretty noticeable. Moving metal around, making mistakes, scratches, stuff like that, it's all going to draw the eye to it. If you're adding a mint mark, you, know, you can glue it or you can solder it. And maybe this one appears to be soldered and it gives it that edge seam instead of the metal flowing down the side. You know, as the metal would flow down the side, this one, it boom, it hits the side, hits the field of the coin and then goes out. This one slopes in, but then it's got the seam. I mean, if it didn't have that, that, that extra metal there, if it just kind of sloped in, it would look like a genuine mint mark. But it didn't. It's got more of that pancake on a griddle. So, there's going to be discoloration around a lot of them. So one of the things that you'll pick up as you get more and more familiar with these coins is that they all have a look. Carson City uh, has a look. Uh, San Francisco certainly does. That's a pretty bold looking, bright, white, frosty, lustrous coin. Carson City's not far off that. Um, you know, Orleans, weak, you know, weakness above the ear type of thing. Philadelphia, somewhere in between. Um, so you'll get a feel for that sometimes. I mean, you can grade the you know, Morgan dollars and you can tell which mint mark is on the reverse when you get really good at it. And you can grade them by the obverse as well frequently, but so I pick up this coin. It's supposed to be a 77 CC. And I'm not really, I don't know. It's yeah, not really seen a CC, but this bothers me. And I would go in for a closer look on that. If I have anything near the date of the mint mark, make this coin look up. You know, that's you know, have a lot of weakness. You know, CCs frequently have a lot of contact to them. But I've got luster all around, protected around the ditch. So I'm not too terribly concerned about that date. But we'll go in for a closer look. Oh, actually, this is a different coin. Um, so there was two red flags on those other one, or red flag on one and not so much on the other. We'll look at this. It doesn't really strike me as a CC obverse. I'm not seeing anything that really concerns me about the date. I'm going to look at the reverse. Um, doesn't. Yeah, you know, but we, we might be okay. We're gonna have to take a closer look. I mean, we've got ambiguity here. We've got red flags. You know, where you, so we're gonna go in. And we're gonna look at that. And you know, as as luck would have it, we have damage near the mint mark. So um, we can either just say, "Oh, forget it. This is just this one's gonna be too much work." I can just find another 1879 CC at somebody else's table, or we can go in for the authentication. Now, if I go in closer, it's a little hard to tell uh, whether I've got a seam or not. Um, this is higher magnification than I typically have on my, my loop. So the easy way to do it would be to break out the Van book. Van Allen and Malice wrote a book and, and all the die pairs are listed in it. 
So I'll pick that up and I'll go for the 1879. And I'll do my little die search and see if I can match up that obverse to uh, the, the characteristics of the obverse to what it's matching CC reverses and see if I can. And in the process, I end up finding some, some of the die markers are here and here, here, and that. Actually, some of the die markers are here, 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 here. And when I uh, kind of look at the title of that page, it's not the 79 CC that I've got in my hand, it's the 79 Philadelphia. So the mint works were in fact added. Kind of burst my bubble on that one. And about one out of, I don't know, let's see, one out of 20, maybe varying times, depending on the market, we have usually about one out of 20, I'll have to go that far with it. It was usually about 19, it would, you can pretty much tell right off the bat. Okay, I picked this coin up, I look at it, and there is nothing on this coin that suggests to me that this is an s -Mint. It's flat, it's dull, it's, yeah. It doesn't look like it's been over-dipped dull. This just looks, yeah, a lackluster strike. Now, and But it does have that s -Mint mark on it, so we're going to have to go in for a closer look. I'm not seeing anything around the mint mark that's giving it away. So we look at the MS mint mark. Well, I'm not really seeing displaced metal. I'm not seeing contact marks. I'm not seeing scratches. I'm not seeing extra metal. Uh, you know, if this is fills, you know, maybe I'd like a little bit more definition in the mint mark. Uh, maybe I should go to the edge and yeah when i go to the edge i see that i've got moved metal and the denticles do aren't lining up uh it looks like this one may have been recut this one's nice and solid this one's been interfered with this is one of those very few uh embossed mint marks on an 80 on that uh that carson city uh or excuse me that s mint uh, that one actually came into the service. Uh, I came into NGC when I was there. Um, and here again, we pick up this coin, 1889 CC, and it does not strike me as being a CC. It doesn't have the look of a CC. I'd expect more from a CC. It won more contact marks in, in, in many cases, but more luster, more, more oomph to it than, than this one has. I look at the date, nothing jumping out at me there. I look at the CC and yes, uh, I am seeing discoloration there, maybe some cleaning. Uh, so I'll go in for a closer look. When I go in for a closer look, uh, yeah, the bit art actually looks good. It may just be coincidental that it has cleaning there. Um, go back. Yeah, this is, you know, that's had a little bit of cleaning on it as well. Uh, but boy, that sure did look suspicious to me. Um, so I've got red flags. I, I could say, well, I'll buy it pending authentication. Um, or we can pick up the van book and play it safe. And we're going to try to match this up. All right, looking at it and we say, well, that might match up to something in the van. We can maybe match it up to an 89 Philadelphia. Uh, I'll take a look around a little bit more. And in the process of looking around, you know, we see all this and all these scratches and this, and that's raising some flags. Um, you know, so as we go in closer to look, we realize, wait a second, they've actually machined out the reverse, the Philly reverse, and then they machined around the CC reverse. And then they inserted the CC reverse into the machined out uh, shell of the 89 Philadelphia obverse. And they just did it with enough precision to make them fit quite nicely. Um, 
as machining gets better, we're seeing more of this. I saw, I think, three of them before I left NGC. I've seen about six of them since then. Uh, it won't have the bell-like tonal qualities, but you're not going to make any friends at a coin show tapping on the edge of the coin or dropping it on the table. So do look. You know, rotate the coin under your light. You will see the sh this area shine more than it would normally. 1893 S. Morinar. I'm sure all of you will add a genuine one of these to your collection in the near future, so we should discuss it. Basically, pretty easy. Um, you can go off of the date. Um, it's usually going to be the last digit in date, or it's going to be the last digit in the date that they're going to alter. Um, uh, but, uh, and you can go off in the van book based on the position of the, the one over the identical and the date rising uh, gently from there, or you can go straight. Uh, here's another shot. You can see this one. It's questionable at best. Um, I'm looking at our dates. Okay, and they goes down in one, goes up in the other. But we've got moved metal. It's it's, it's quite a mess. Uh, but we, when you do these, you know, you know, just to play it safe, you go off the van book because the van clearly illustrates the position of the one over uh, how it relates to the identicals. But I go straight to the T in Liberty. I want that raised line. Uh, sometimes I can even get this fairly easy visible. Sometimes it's filled with dirt, nothing, a little acetone on a Q-tip won't remove it. And then I have these rabbit ears uh, that are going to show up. This is a scanning electron microscope, so it makes it look like it's in reverse, but it's not. But that's a raised line, raised line, the raised line, and then it shows up there. Uh, if this is all filled with dirt, then the dealer can't be sure that he's got a genuine coin either. Uh, and if it's filled, if it's dirt, it's more often than not, it's usually a date alter, I mean, a mint mark alteration. So all you need to do is remember that. The fine line, uh, fine tool mark race line, or the rabbit ear, and the rabbit ear. And they're usually both visible. This one here is also quite easy to authenticate. Um, we don't really even need to look at the obverse. We're going to go straight to the reverse. I'll at least show you where it is right here in this area, just flip the coin, go straight there. And we're gonna look for a little X of raised uh, <clears throat> die polish or tool marks right there. And a little die gouge there, a raised line. And that's gonna show up in all of them because it's in a protected area. Sometimes it may get dirt on it, but all of them. You can authenticate all of the 1893 and 1894 dollars that come your way. Really easy. You will come across other dollars that are much more difficult to authenticate for one reason or another, like some of those CCs that we saw earlier. Uh, but these, I mean, the, the, the rarer dates in the series turn out to be the easier ones to authenticate. And since you'll all probably have an 1895 silver dollar proof, because they're so affordable, um, these alterations are actually few and far between because uh, uh, I think all of them that have that year carry a, a bit of a premium. And when one, it's kind of hard to change a, a mint mark on, a, on an 1895 and make it look magically proof. They, the rims are going to be different. But if they do it, they, they, there's going to be a, a depressed area where the mint mark was removed. The coin's probably going to be whizzed. The, mint, the dates are going to be, the, the digits are going to be the wrong style. And if you still can't confirm it off of all of that, off of any of those uh, features, whether it's a mint mark or a date that's been changed, you go to the VAM book and you line it up. Uh, or you can go to Heritage and you line up the one over where it should be over the denticles. And that'll kind of confirm whether it uh, is genuine or not. Pick up this 1904 S and it didn't have an S obverse. Then we go in for a closer look and there it is. They didn't even try to cover that. We dropped it on the table with thuds. All right. 
Moving on to the next one, 1928. Now there's little die polish. You know, we picked this coin up. I'll always go to the E. I always like finding this because it's in a nice protected area. These few lines of tool marks are, are, are uh, tell you it's genuine. Um, then some of these marks, which are harder to find, uh, are here. Um, they're going to wear faster. So I usually go off of this. Uh, if the coin has been harshly cleaned, then I might run into some trouble. There's this one as well. If the coin's harshly cleaned, this is harder to find. This one in the hair, back in here, uh, is, is almost always there. But frequently, let's see if I've got that picture. Uh, you can tell just by looking at the date, whether there's an alteration or, or for uh, the metal and the, where the mint mark should be. Um, this one, of course, th these blend into the field rather nicely. These, no, it looks like it's just sitting there on the top of the coin. Uh, another way of looking at it too is that one is more of a broad rim. Here's our 28 and here's our 28S. S has the broader rim. The nice thing about peach dollars is, unlike the Morgan dollar, is it is a sculpted field coin, meaning the field comes in and kind of rises to the center of the coin, and then it goes out and rises to the rim. So you're not dealing with a flat field like you are on the Morgan dollar, for example. So the mint mark frequently sits on a hill or in a lake, but within a slope. So, I mean, you look at this mint mark, let's say we were gonna remove this mint mark, how well is that gonna go for you? Probably not, you're gonna have a removed mint mark in a hole and it's a satin luster coin, so it's gonna have horribly impaired luster. Likewise, if you wanna, you have a, a, a this, if this was a filly, this would all be smooth and scoped. And if you wanted to add a mint mark, it's gonna sit on the coin. It's just gonna sit right on the surface of the coin and look foreign to the rest of the, uh, foreign to its surrounding surfaces. So let's look at a few examples of that. Yeah, like, it's too bad we're not, all in the same room right now because I'd have asked for a show of hands of how many people think this is original, you know, and just cleaned, removed mint mark, and then harshly cleaned, added mint mark, or genuine mint mark, this one being a genuine mint mark, sits in that little depression from where the punch hit, and it interrupts the sculpted field. Whereas the added mint mark sat on it like a pancake on a griddle. And now, this is a fun one. The uh, oh, what they call godless dollar. Now th this, this is a tip you can do for a lot of your large cents. They were struck prior to 1836. That's when we started striking coins and collars. Um, a lot of times, if you look at those early large cents and you'll see, you look at the edge, um, you'll see lines like this. You know, and you may have some red flags, other red flags going on uh, for why you're looking at the coin, but you look at the edge and you always look at the edge on a large cent. Um, you know, some of them will have seams, some of them will be just fine. But if you have a large cent with a, a flat edge like this, and you can actually stand that coin on its edge, and it's prior to 1836, that coin was struck in a collar, which makes it most likely Chinese counterfeit. And we're seeing a lot of them. You can buy a complete set on AliExpress, and you used to be able to buy a complete set on Wish. So we're going to look at this. If this is ejection marks from being struck in a collar, Okay, so this is our in God, uh, our godless doll. This is our in God we trust on the edge of the presidential dollar. Some of them didn't have it, so we look at the edge. Now, if we look at the edge and see this, it means it was struck in a collar and it just didn't get the in God we trust. If we look at this, we can see that the edge was filed off. So this is a great indication that a coin that should have been struck in a collar is genuine. And a coin that should not have been struck in a collar is not. And it also shows you what the original edge looked like on the godless dollar. So 
that pretty much wraps it up for our key for the vast majority of our mint mark alterations. Um, let's see what questions we have. Are you going to confiscate coin? No, they won't. They won't confiscate the coin. They're not law enforcement. Uh, they they are relying on you. Well, it can, plus you might want to get the money back from whoever you purchased it from. Um, and in cases where uh, they, they, they've helped people chase back the coin when it's been a few different people and stuff like that. Uh, if you want to protect the hobby, the best thing you can do is uh, donate it to the a and Museum. Uh, we will use it in classes. It will be permanently removed from the marketplace. And, uh, you know, the Secret Service knows we have them and they are probably quite happy that we do it. I consult for the Secret Service. I'm working on a couple of things with them right now. Uh, and uh, they turned to uh, the ANA for assistance and also for the, to the Anti-Counterfeiting Educational Foundation as well for, for stuff. So, yeah, they, they won't confiscate it. We, we used to send notes back asking you to protect the hobby by... Uh, uh, promote the hobby by protecting it and uh, give uh, the coins to uh, the a &A. Any other questions? Anyone else have any other questions for Brian? Well, Brian, thanks as always for your uh, trilogy of one of your presentations here in the last week. Thanks to everyone Oh, we do have one more question. Oh, that's a question for you. Oh, yeah. For the yeah, question on, on the counterfeits or sending the ANA counterfeits, my name is Andy Dickus, and I that's actually right up my alley. I'm the I serve in collection management uh, capacities here. So just send it to the ANA. Uh, care of the money museum and we'll make sure that we get it and we send you the proper paperwork and you can figure out the tax deduction you want to take with the irs so yeah that's helpful i mean i, I don't think we have we don't have an 1895 s double in the collection so it'd be very interesting to see it very good brian okay. thanks again yep my pleasure uh, for those of you who haven't watched all of our e-learning presentations, which I'd assume is probably all of you, they are online at money.org. You just go to recorded webinars and you can watch this presentation again, what Brian did last week and all of our other e-learning presentations, which we started last year out of necessity. Again, please join us next year for the real thing, summer seminar here in Colorado Springs. Hopefully we can have a, a, a a healthy and vibrant environment like we're so used to and miss so much right now. And thanks to the Gray Sheet for their continued promotion of our e-learning presentations. Check the e-learning academy for more presentations coming up here in the near future. And thanks again for joining us, everyone. Bye.